Have you ever gotten a free flight because of your Delta SkyMiles card? Or maybe a near impossible restaurant reservation thanks to your Platinum American Express card? What about that five minute TSA pre-check line, a perk of your Capital One Venture Rewards card? And of course, we can't forget about that airport lounge access because of your Chase Sapphire Reserve card. About 90% of all money spent on credit cards is on rewards cards. We have created an ecosystem where we have essentially been given a drug to the consumer, which is these rewards cards. And the reason we keep giving this drug is we know it's highly profitable and we know the consumer is addicted to it. If you play the game right and maximize your rewards, you can save at least a few hundred dollars every year. But every time you pay for something with a credit card, you're borrowing money from the card issuer to cover your purchase. Money you have to pay back either in full at the end of the month or over time. If the latter, that's with interest accumulated. While there are some Americans winning on these cards, meaning they might be reeling in travel points, cash back, and free subscriptions left and right, others are losing money, paying more in interest than they're getting in perks. We have alerts that alert customers to when their payments are due. We're very, very committed to the idea of our customers using credit responsibly, paying on time, uh, and having that credit card help them grow their credit profile. Credit card companies should take some level of responsibility. Card companies must educate the consumer. Nonetheless, Americans have debt, a lot of it. So we decided to take a deeper look to see who's winning versus who's losing on these rewards cards because experts say there's a pattern. In 2019, the largest U.S. banks reported $9.9 .9 billion in fee income, $89.7 billion in interest income, and $41.3 billion from interchange fees on credit cards. That's a total of more than $140 billion in revenue from credit cards alone. According to experts, more than half of that comes from rewards cards. It's hugely profitable. People who use reward cards, they tend to spend more and they tend to have more debt on their reward cards and they tend to default more. Let's go through the three revenue sources. When we talk about fees, we're referring to annual, foreign transaction, late and over the limit fees. Americans with higher credit scores are typically paying more in annual and foreign transaction fees as they're using more premium cards with higher annual fees and they travel internationally more. Meanwhile, those with lower credit scores are more likely to be hit with late and over the limit fees as they're less likely to have the cash to pay their balances on time. Interest is the price you pay to borrow money. For credit cards, that's the annual percentage rate or APR. As of early 2023, the average APR for credit cards is about 21%, marking the highest rate since the Fed started tracking this nearly three decades ago. As for the top rated rewards cards, the APRs can range from around 17 to 30%. Now who's paying that? It's generally low income households because they're more likely to carry credit card debt month to month. They also typically have higher APRs as they have lower credit scores. As for interchange, sometimes referred to as swipe fees, those are typically invisible to the consumer. Every time a retailer processes a credit card payment, the merchant pays an interchange fee to cover the costs associated with accepting, processing, and authorizing the transaction. Merchants pay more than $120 billion each year to accept cards. Business owners set prices with that in mind. Some with the goal of passing part of that cost onto the consumer. That means higher prices overall for those who are wealthy, have lower incomes, and those who don't even have credit cards and don't reap the benefits of them. It is unfair, but it's something that, you know, people who are uh, in underserved communities or impoverished communities have dealt with all the time. As the cost of living rises, Americans are relying more on credit cards. Credit cards accounted for 32% of in-person payments in 2021, up from 20% in 2016. Whether it's Jennifer Garner asking, what's in your wallet? Or your friend bragging that their flights were free because they used points. Rewards credit cards are everywhere and hugely popular. In 2019 and 2020, about 90% of all money spent on credit cards was on rewards cards. The purpose, of course, is to get those perks. The way you get rewards is you gotta use it a lot because the more you spend, the more you get. We tend to think that all customers can benefit uh, from a rewards card, uh, regardless of their circumstance. Let's take the popular Chase Freedom Unlimited card, for example. Consumers love this card because it has no annual fee, 1.5 to 5% cash back, and no APR, but only for the first 15 months. 
So let's say you get this card. If at any point in time after month 15 you don't pay your balance in full, your APR could be as high as 29%. Your penalty APR for a late payment? Nearly 30%. Just the math will not add up. I mean, the rewards cannot be 18%. The rewards are only 1% or 2% of all the purchase. Whereas for every dollar you purchase, if you get a reward of 1%, you're paying 18% interest on it. I would, I guess, refute the notion that they're losing money. Um, the fact is, there are any number of reasons why somebody may choose to carry a balance. Uh, in some instances, it's convenience. In some instances, it's cash flow. In some instances, um, it may be circumstances where you know they have short-term liquidity needs that credit cards address. The idea of a carrying a balance is separate and apart from the benefits of earning rewards. Avoiding debt to make your rewards card worthwhile is certainly a good strategy. But the reality is, Americans have a lot of debt. Credit cards are one of the largest sources of consumer debt. On average, Americans carry $6,194 in credit card debt. In 2023, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau estimated that outstanding credit card debt may continue to set records and could even hit $1 trillion. The bank's goal is twofold. One is to go for you to go out and spend. As soon as you spend, they make money because of the interchange fee. The second goal is for you to carry debt. Now they realize invariably the rich don't carry much debt. It's the poor who carry a lot of debt because they're liquidity constraints, they don't have enough money. So they rather give it to the poor people or the low FICO score people, the reward cards. Summit Agrawal is an economist who has studied credit cards for more than 20 years. Using data from a large US financial institution, he, along with others, analyzed how consumers change their spending habits on credit cards in order to get cash back. They claim credit card rewards incentivize subprime and near-prime consumers to overspend and overborrow on their cards. That's consumers who have credit scores ranging from 580 to 619 and 620 to 659, respectively. And data from the Federal Reserve Bank of New York supports that, showing that low-income cardholders have higher delinquencies and higher median balances in collections. They also have a much larger debt-to-income ratio with their credit card debt, accounting for more than 26% of their total income. In comparison, Americans with much higher incomes, their debt accounts for only 4% of their income on average. While rewards are great, I mean, who doesn't love a free flight or nights at a five-star hotel in the Caribbean, right? But not everyone is getting to the point where flights are actually free. So the question is, do these cards pay off for everyone? Super Prime cardholders or those with credit scores of 720 and higher earn on average $9.50 in rewards and pay $7.10 less in interest on rewards cards than on classic cards. However, subprime consumers or those with lower credit scores earn only $1.80 in rewards and pay $6.40 more in interest. That means cardholders who rank highly on a credit score model like FICO on average earn money with the use of rewards cards while low FICO cardholders, on average, lose money. They tend to spend more, have more debt on their rewards cards, and default more. But the rewards card kills me because they, they're encouraging them to have bad behavior, to use it and use it and use it, so they get more rewards. And at the end of the day, the problem is they're not paying it off every month. The poor keep getting poorer, the rich keep getting richer. Because of the differences between those who are and aren't reeling in the rewards, Agarwal and his co-authors estimate an annual redistribution of more than $15 billion, from less to more educated, poorer to richer, and high to low minority areas, widening existing disparities. That means they're claiming there's $15 billion that could be distributed in a different way to achieve greater equality. Low FICO customers are essentially spending so much more to get access to the rewards, which is only 2% or 3% of the total value of the spending, they accumulate debt and that debt accumulation causes this huge interest payment that is going to the bank and it's also going to the high FICO score customers because these high FICO score customers are only using these rewards but not accumulating any debt. So they are being cross-subsidized in the process of using their reward cards. Rewards are not funded by interest and other fees. While there are certainly customers who choose 
to borrow on their credit cards. That is not typically the revenue streams that are funding rewards cards. And so I think the premise and the flawed premise behind the study uh, was that those who are carrying balances and therefore paying interest um, are actually cross-subsidizing or contributing to the profitability of rewards programs overall. Uh, that is actually not the case. Our rewards products are designed to be independently profitable, and so those customers, even those that pay in their balances in full every single month, are, are profitable and desirable customers for Capital One and other issuers across the industry. But you also have other customers who may borrow on their credit cards and uh, therefore pay interest, and that contributes to the, uh, the economics of those products. But those are separate and apart from one another. There's no cross-subsidization that goes on. Agarwal and his co-authors are not the first, nor are they the only economists to make these claims. A 2010 research paper states, on average and after accounting for rewards paid to households by banks, the lowest income household pays $21 and the highest income household receives $750 every year. According to Capital One, in 2022, $7.6 billion was handed to customers in rewards. The bank says that's covered by interchange fee revenue alone. However, the company didn't share how much it brings in from fees and interest on rewards cards. Each one of our credit cards is designed to be profitable, not to rely on cross-subsidization from other products. The vast majority of our rewards customers uh, pay in full every month, so uh, don't actually pay any interest uh, or other fees. Um, and so it's really the interchange fee revenue, the annual fees, and then relationships with co-brands that fund the cards. In its 2022 10K report, Capital One's net interest income for all credit cards was nearly three times its non-interest income. In addition, net interest income increased by $2.5 billion in 2022 from 2021. The bank saying that was primarily driven by higher average loan balances. While the credit card business is hugely profitable for a bank, serving a wide range of customers is also risky. Capital One's provision for credit losses, or the company's estimate of how much it might lose due to credit risk, was nearly $4.3 billion in 2022, about 19% of total revenue. Do you think that banks would continue to offer the same rewards, the same perks that they're currently offering if they weren't getting the interest that they're currently getting? I think um, any banker will have a hard time considering this scenario because it's impossible to think about credit cards without interest. They're, I mean, they're, it's a lending business and finance charges is part of the lending business. While when played right, the credit card rewards game can be beneficial for some and a slippery slope for others, there are Americans who are using credit cards for a different kind of perk. One that's not considered a quote unquote reward, purchasing power. The reason why I made it out of the barrio and my parents who are immigrants from Mexico made it out was because they learned how to leverage debt and they borrowed money. But the thing is, if consumers are going to borrow, they need to do it right. As of 2023, Americans owe nearly $1 trillion in credit card debt, with more than half living paycheck to paycheck. Most of my clients that are in the survival or the struggle stage, um, they're, they're working two jobs, they've got kids, they've got a family. They're not taking the time to sit down and read the Wall Street Journal. They're not reading The Economist. They're not seeing what's going on and how certain things are affecting them. When I'm working with somebody who's struggling, I want them to have a credit card. I just need to educate them on how to use it responsibly. Luis Baraja says rewards cards aren't the best option for some people. In fact, for those who can't pay their balances each month, Many CFPs recommend staying away from most credit cards. However, it's a catch-22. You can't get better credit cards or borrow money without a good credit score. And you can't get a better credit score without building your credit. That's where secured credit cards come in. So you have a savings account where you'll deposit 500 bucks or 300 bucks or whatever credit limit they're gonna give you, and you use that, but the bank knows that you have money to cover that up to that amount. As you become responsible and using that credit card, then the limit goes higher and goes higher and goes higher. And then you start building up your credit score. That's the best way to do it. We just need to teach people how to be proactive and how to defend themselves and how to you know, ask the right questions. Lack of financial literacy is an ongoing problem in America. While more education is needed, according to researchers, banks aren't completely innocent. Look, ultimately, the consumers are making the mistake of using these cards. There was no gun put to the head of the consumer who's poor, has a reward card, go spend on it. They spend out of their free will. But on the same time, the banks know that what they are doing, 
They are trying to entice the consumer to go out and spend. We are firm believers in financial education and making sure that our customers are, are informed of both the benefits and the risks of using credit cards. So would you recommend that all Americans get a rewards credit card regardless of where they live in the country and regardless of their income? Yes, I think uh, the if, if you're going to get a credit card uh, and you can qualify for a rewards card, you should absolutely do it. Experts say legislation could make a difference too. In 2010, the federal government and 17 states sued the major credit card companies for prohibiting merchants from incentivizing customers to use cards that charged lower swipe fees. But in 2018, the Supreme Court upheld the company's right to do so, a setback in the fight for equality within the American payment system. Meanwhile, the Credit Card Competition Act was introduced in both chambers of Congress in 2022. The legislation would require credit cards issued by the country's largest banks to be processed through at least two different networks. According to an analysis by CMSPI, it could save merchants and their customers $11 billion a year. Well, we're definitely opposed to this legislation, which we believe is an inappropriate price control. So are there other solutions to evening the playing field? CFPB has made regulation, like the card act, that was hugely successful because they said we will eliminate over limit fees so you cannot go over limit on your credit card. Similarly, they could come up with regulation that will say that if you are giving rewards card, the rewards card interest income or interest rates that you can charge has to be capped at a certain number. I could also say the banks could do it voluntarily, but I don't have much hope on that. What do you think the credit card rewards business would look like if all of the consumers of rewards credit cards were highly financially sophisticated. I think you'd see a significant erosion in the value of rewards. If you're competing among a smaller, well-educated customer segment, your customers would more naturally identify the winner when it comes to the math, if they're all sophisticated and are absolutely 100% optimizing payment days, and the costs would shift away from rewards to capture the volume from that sophisticated customer segment. But doesn't that then mean that the banks need less sophisticated individuals to participate in this business in order for it to be so profitable that they can continue to offer such great rewards? 100%, yes. They need unsophisticated customers, high credit scores, medium credit scores, and low credit scores. Absolutely. If everyone made the rationally correct decision at every point, the banking industry in the U.S. would, would probably not exist.